Okay, it says it's recording. Well, welcome everybody. I hope you are all having a great week. We have a packed agenda today and we are going to start off with Susie Perry. She's going to share our amazing new website. She's also going to um, share an example of least restrictive environment in the context of 619. And then she has two new scenarios to share with you when we're looking at um, placement codes and where children can be placed in the mixed delivery system. I'm then gonna go over some quick updates and then we're gonna remind you once again about the COAST training tomorrow. Oh, and then one last thing, we're just gonna review child finds very quickly because there's been a question about that from business managers. So I will turn it over to Susie. All right, um, I'm gonna share my screen here and I think actually I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put the links in the chat. So we do have um, the beginnings of a, an, web pages that will provide you with information for those of you who are in cohort one of early childhood special education services to preschool age children with disabilities. And so we wanted to make sure that you had a place to go to find information, to um, access the um, trainings that we've uh, shared with you and um, so here it is, da, 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 da. Um, we hope to expand on this. We are I'm working behind the scenes every day, putting together additional resources. But to get us started, um, this will be resources, tools, notices, and opportunities for professional development and collaboration for SAUs participating in cohort one uh, for this school year. And so here are some of the um, cards that they call these cards. The first one is uh, around the foundational um, elements of the work that we're doing. It talks about what a free appropriate public education is. Um, it has a reference to the legislation that um, has sponsored these changes. Um, a link to the early childhood side of our um, colleagues that um, establish kind of like the tier one foundational, what is um, high quality early childhood education programs and um, what are the elements of those. We have an, a link to the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. That's our Department of Ed special ed uh, department. And then um, another, Important element is um, the work that we do to engage families and build partnerships so that this work can move forward. So these five parts really kind of form the foundation of the work. Um, and then to build on that, we wanted to offer information about what are the elements of a free appropriate public education. So if I clicked on that link, it will take you to a, a separate page and I'll just quickly kind of scroll through this. It talks about what the FAPE mandate is. This came um, directly from one of the PowerPoint presentations that we've shared with you. We talk about the um, special child find and the special education process and how children enter into early childhood special education, um, some of the eligibility information. It talks about what we mean when we say least restrictive environment some um, links to the um, graphics around the continuum of placement options. Some of these are, are tools that you can use in presentations that you might be uh, required to make to your um, um, colleagues and, and constituents. It has information about um, how we are suggesting that children have access to uh, preschool programs so that they can get their free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. So really looking at a variety of different settings in public pre-K, um, what do we mean by private programs? Um, it references Head Start programs and we're gonna be kind of building this out a little bit more to have links to these additional, um, um, you know, like what do we mean by CTE? 
what, what are the opportunities around Title I Head Start programs to further explain those. So watch for additional links as um, you um, head back to these pages. We also wanted to talk a bit about uh, suspension and expulsion. And I think we're gonna be um, doing some additional PD or technical assistance on this topic, but these are some um, broad links that will take you to information that's already established from our federal and state um, partners. And then a reference to the work that we're doing, how the intent of this is to achieve um, results for our preschool age children with disabilities. How do we um, acknowledge that? How do we improve on those results? So as I said, this is just the beginning of um, a series of pages that will be kind of leading off of the main page here. We also have um, links to all of the cohort meetings and the recordings and some of the PowerPoint presentations that have been delivered to you so far. And so um, I think if the, uh, any questions or anything that, any requests on this page, on these pages for the future, Susie, I was just going to chime in. Um, one of the pieces that we really talked about uh, when we first started meeting was trying to make sure there was a sort of a landing spot where you could return to to look for um, resources that are referenced during these meetings. Um, certainly, there are the recordings, but I think as we've reflected before, sometimes recordings take more time than, yeah. than anything else, and it's hard to get back to them. Um, but we'll continue to work to build this out to have the resources that you need, um, as Susie's pointing to, um, other documents that that you can grab um, and make them as, as accessible as possible. So as something occurs to you where you're looking for something um, and you think it would be helpful to be on there, please share that information with Sandy, Susie, or Jen. And some additional sections that we plan for here is personnel development, data submission, data collection and submission, and um, uh, the professional, uh, I think, I don't know, I think those are just two that come to mind that are next up for us that we're working on. All righty, so um, next on our agenda is um, talking about um, I think it's from a question that came in, and we wanted to talk a little bit about a least restrictive um, environment example. So I don't know, Sandy, do you think I should share the document or just kind of talk about it? What's your... I don't know what document you're referring to. Okay, so um, I think we had kind of codified what was the um, the question was that there was a child with a disability um, that had needs identified on their IEP and that they had goals written to meet those needs and that they will have services and supports identified to meet the goals. And um, so let's see, what was the main question on this one? The services and supports um, that are on the IEP um, were two 30 minute sessions per week for a speech therapy in a separate setting. And let's see, what is the question here? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, I blanked on uh, what we've been asking IEP teams to do in the cohort meetings is to be able to describe the environment that would be needed for the child to meet the goals. Oh, so this was the one about whether or not the, the code was, uh, what the code would be for a situation such as what we're describing right here. And so if a child was attending a program, for example, two 30 minute sessions of speech therapy and they were receiving them in a therapeutic setting or a speech therapy office, um, what the code would be for that. So if the child is not attending any other program they're not going to a child care program. They are only at home and then going in for that speech session. The code for this would be service provider location. Um, so I think in the past, that might not have been um, included in the um, 
consideration by the district that's uh, or the maybe in CDS where we you're supposed to look at all of the programs the child is attending during the day in order to determine what the um, environment is and how to code that environment. So if a child is attending, a preschool age child was attending any other program and was getting speech services pulled out in a separate location, um, that would be a different code. But in this case, the child is only going to speech therapy. Um, they're not going to a, uh, a regular early childhood program then it would be service provider location. So is that ringing a bell for um, anyone? Is that, was that a question that came up for anyone on this call? No, it's okay. All right, so that was just a um, one question that came in. And so if you have questions like that, we are, um, prepared to and are, you know, very willing to kind of walk through those with you. And um, I think um, sending an email to Jen and sending the question in is a great way to do it. And as a team, we can talk through those issues and then present to the whole group so that everybody has answers to those questions as they come up. And so that would bring us to our next uh, um, section on the um, scenarios and least restrictive environment. And I think when we left, left, left off, we were at scenario number six. And uh, so let's put that up here. Oops, sorry about that. I thought I did it from the current slide. Close your eyes for a sec. A quick review. Okay, here we go. So as you remember, we have been looking at um, when IEP teams get together and are evaluating children, determining them eligible, and then writing the individualized education plan. Um, we are asking the IEP team to talk through these um, bullet points um, to, to look at where the child is currently and how much time they're spending in preschool in a, in a program or not. To, to look into what the family wants or needs as uh, for their child that's been identified with a disability, to look at what kinds of programs are available in the district or the community, and what the child's needs and eligibility are, and what the IEP services and programs and hours will be, and, and then what options that the, um, the IEP team considered and then ultimately to decide what is the least restrictive environment, what is the code for that environment, and then what are some of the district's next steps. So we've looked at it, we've looked at a number of different scenarios. We've sent out um, the uh, slides from those scenarios after each discussion, and so we have a couple um, new ones that we haven't looked at yet. And so. Um, what we've been doing lately is asking this group to participate a little bit more and think about if this, this is the setup for the scenario, what might the decision be for the IEP team? What would be the placement for that child? What would be the code? And what might be some of the district next steps? So in this case, we have a child who's three years old and the child needs a service. And in this case, for example, speech, just like we were talking about, um, and when we um, inquired of the family, the parents said that they were not interested in sending their child to a preschool setting. And also the parent does not have a car. Um, the IEP team said that the child need, needed 20 minutes of uh, speech therapy three times a week. And the team did not believe that the child needed a program. So probably some articulation, um, challenges or maybe um, some language or communication challenges that could be met through this amount of service. Um, the district looked at what they had available in the community and within their, uh, their district, and they had a full continuum of placement options from everything from self-contained programs and to um, um, childcare programs, Head Start uh, in the boundaries. 
And so if this was a situation that um, was presented to you, what do you think the IEP team might offer? Or what are some options that um, we could think about uh, to provide services to this child and what would be the placement and the LRE code? Any brave volunteers today? We had a great conversations last time. And so I'm looking forward to that again today. Scott? Can I just ask a clarifying question? Where does the child spend their day? At home? At home. Yep, at home. All right. Thank you. Scott has his hand up. I put it down. I'll put it down. Oh, okay. Thanks, Scott. So if you're chairing the IEP team meeting, question is sort of where would you go with this? We have good wait time. Scott has his hand up. Scott. Thanks. Yeah, all right. Since I asked the question, I guess I'll answer it. So I would, hopefully, the team would offer the speech service and transportation for the kid to come in for that session in my district. And then, I mean, the placements within the home. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the LRE codes by, by heart right now, so. That's okay, so um, that would be service provider location, SPL. All right. Because the child is not in any other program. Right, right. And so what might be some things that the district would have to do in order to accomplish that? They'd have to amend the IEP to include specialized transportation. Um, and they'd have to, you know, look at their service times um, and make sure those, those line up. Um, you know, and then implement the transportation if that's what we're offering. So Scott, was that an IEP team decision that the child needed specialized transportation? Or is it well, for just me, that he needs a ride? <clears throat> well, he needs a ride and I have specialized transportation. That's the only transportation I have for a ride. So I wouldn't have wouldn't be able to use a general ed bus because the way those routes run, I would have to use specialized transportation because the time that the student would come in would not align with the regular ed transportation times. And if the purpose of special ed transportation is to get to a kid to their special education and related services, then that's what we would do. So I think that that Let's might warrant Lou. further conversation. Lou has his hand up. Maybe he's got Lou. some other ideas. Okay. Yeah, I'm just remembering what uh, Aaron said last week about special transportation versus what, what kind of vehicle you're taking. Even if you're using a special ed bus, it doesn't mean that the child requires special ed transportation. It just means he needs a ride to and from speech. Yeah. Remembering what she said. Yeah. And, you know, last week I was in mediation, so I missed last week. Um, that's good to know. All right. And I was wondering whether or not you know, is the parent set on not being in a preschool setting? And what might be the benefits for that child? What if you could get pick him up on the bus and bring him to the preschool program that the district has for that 30 minutes? You know, so get him in the morning when everybody comes. He just stays for 30 minutes and we only have to transport him back home. But then that kind of changes the... Um, LRE code, right? Because he is in a program with typical kids for a portion of the day, it will be under the 10 hours. It, it throws you off a bit, Sandy, though, and number three, where it says does not need a program. Yeah, so I'm assuming um, that's they'd already talked about you know, he needs speech, but not a program. Yeah, so could he attend, though, the program to get his speech with other kids? 
I'm, I'm sure that's a possibility. I, I thought that the team, I guess the team didn't determine that. It just said special ed needs on the IEP. That's what confused me. Mm -hmm. I heard CSS does not need a program, but are you giving him a program if he's just going there for that 30 minutes in the morning to get his, um, so he might be in a small group in the preschool classroom, getting his specially designed instruction, his speech therapy service for that 30 minutes, and then he goes home after that. And wouldn't that be a nice entree for the parent to be able to see, maybe this is of benefit for my child to develop some additional skills and to access the general ed setting. So I don't know, it's just sort of, you know, sometimes the parent says they don't want this and it says, the, the, they say, well, he doesn't need a program, but you could provide him with a program. There's nothing saying that you can't. So anyway, it's just some, it's just some idea. So what we had, let's see, what we had on that was um, special education services will be offered at a therapeutic setting. The parent doesn't have access to a car every day that therapy is scheduled. A bus will transport the child or a parent reimbursement for allowable transportation uh, costs will be provided. Um, child is eligible and not attending any other preschool program, so it's SPL, and the district would uh, enroll and arrange for transportation and services, enroll the child as attending being in the district of residence. So that's kind of a, uh, how that one rolled out. Um, our next scenario is, we, we I just left it all in here for you, um, a child who's four years old attending a public pre-K program in an elementary school, and the parent wants the child to re remain in both currently attending programs. So the child is going to public pre-K in the morning and head start in the afternoon. Um, on his IEP, he needs 30 minutes, three times per week of special education services. And the IEP team says that he needs a program to generalize skill development. Um, so the district has a half day pre-K program and local childcare programs, and apparently also a Head Start that, was, that we didn't include there. The decision of the IEP team was that the child will attend the public pre-K for half a day and half a day at the Head Start and special education services will be delivered in both settings. So perhaps some special education, like a therapy in one setting and some um, a different therapy or special education instruction at uh, the other setting. And so in that case, the child would be in a regular early childhood program with the services in the classroom. And it is more than 10 hours per week. So we um, picked this code and that the Next steps for the district would be to enroll the child as a student, um, establish the MOU with the Head Start, and determine which services are provided in the two locations, and make sure to contract with providers for those services. So they could be in-district providers, they might be CDS providers, um, it just depends on what, what would make the most sense for that uh, location, for that region. Comments or questions on that one? challenges. You guys are getting good at this then. So just as a, as a question, so um, how is, is the a half day at Head Start one of the IEP team determinations? Um, apparently in this case, the child was already in these two settings because at the district, there was only a half day pre-K program, but the parent needs coverage for the entire day. So the child attended and was transported to the Head Start program after lunch. Unfortunate, but apparently that's what happens in some cases. Sandy? Yep, so this, it wouldn't necessarily be an IEP team 
decision that you would put on an IEP. Head Start is not a service, but it could be part of the conversation when you're looking at least restrictive environment and documenting that on the written notice and or in the service location page where some of like in, in this case, let's just say at Head Start, he was able to, re he or she was able to receive speech and OT. And so on the service location, on the IEP, on the service page, it would, it state that regular education. Yep, we would want to make sure that the family knew that there was a, we filled out that part on the services page that said where those services were going to be provided. So I think what I'd like to do is just ask if any of you are having difficulty with the LRE codes at this point when you're looking at registering students. Hey Beth, you've raised your hand. Do you want to just say, Beth, yes, you are having difficulty, or is there anything you want to share right now? Uh, we're just having difficulty because we have so many private pre-Ks in York, and so determining the number of hours that children attend, which is outside of the IEP determination for those settings, is complicated for us kind of scurrying and trying to get that to you by next week. Because some kids have been allowed in for a certain number of hours just based on availability. Others are attending a full program. So tracking all that information is challenging and it's outside of the IEP determination. So we'll have it when we calculate the least restrictive environment. But for this first wave of paperwork, it's just presenting some challenges for us to determine who's in more than 10 hours or less than 10 hours. Okay, so this is a great question, Susie. Are the um, hours or the hours that are in the LRE code reflect any time that a child is attending a program or is it just what the IEP team is just determining is that general education part of their day through it's the IEP? All, it should reflect all of the time that the child has access to a regular early childhood program. For, for the two codes for the uh, for the four um, codes that are regular early childhood program services in the program, nine hours, that's one. One is a 10 hour. One is a uh, regular early childhood program, getting the services not in the program, nine hours, getting the services not in the program, 10 hours or more. So really you just need to determine, is it less than 10 hours or more than 10 hours? So, you know, it's not an exact number. You just have to know per week, is it more than less, more than 10 or less than 10? 10 or more under 10. And we will attach with um, the minutes from this meeting, the visual that Susie created. I know it was part of the PowerPoint at one, at one time, but we've pulled that out of the PowerPoint and have been sharing it. I don't know if you can find that quickly. <laughs> Yep, there it is. So this, we have this as a PDF and we will share it. It's a great visual to keep handy when you're trying to um, figure out the LRE codes. I hope that helped Beth, but if you have specific examples that you need to walk through, um, what I, um, our data team is asking that you um, contact the help desk. And if they need help with that, they can contact us as well. Because the October 1 child count is coming up, isn't it? So we really yep. want to make sure to have all that information collected and so that you get credit for all of the kids that you're serving and uh, that we're able to have that data um, on time and accurate. Right, Kathy? <laughs> I don't know if Kathy's here. Yeah, um, she is. Oh, she is. Okay. 
Lou, did you have a question? Well, I, I, I think the director is like I did um, for many years. I, I think the struggle will be not in counting up the hours they're actually in somewhere, but what is the payment responsibility of the district for the amount of hours the team determines. And the problem we got into, um, at least in the Lewiston area, was that um, if a private pre-K had a 10-hour program and you only needed really two hours to generalize a language experience, they still wanted you to pay for the full 10 hours. And it became really a stumbling block in almost every conversation we had with folks because they said, we're, you know, we want you to pay for the whole half day experience, not just a portion of it. And that became a back and forth for years. I don't know if there's really been any um, concrete resolution to that. It becomes a discussion with the pre-K that can be very difficult. So I just want to acknowledge to directors, I've been there. I realize how weird it can get when folks are asking you to pay for 20 hours and you only need three. And I think that problem's still out there, Sandy. Yes, and I don't think it's um, specific to Maine as well as I'm learning more about 619 and Susie shaking her head. But what we are, what our guidance is, is that is as, as 619 transitions to the SAUs, that will be up to the SAUs to have those conversations and negotiations with their local child care um, on the, on whether it's an hourly, half day, or full day rate. And Susie, it looks like you have something to add. Yeah, um, you know, we we are in contact with other state agency organizations, child care, and having these conversations and letting them know that this is a barrier that we're experiencing. And so, um, you know, we're trying to surface the problem so that we can have support in addressing it. And I think part of it is, you know, initially, whenever there's a problem is we have to let everybody know that this is a problem. Some people don't even recognize it as a problem. And so, you know, our conversations with childcare, with the general ed side of things, with the Department of Health um, side of things, kind of surfacing some of these challenges um, it's our intention to help, um, you know, negotiate and talk about the opportunity and the possibility of prorating um, some of these costs based on the number of hours. I just Maybe. want to chime in here because I think there, we're kind of running the risk of getting a little bit too much in the weeds as if that's ever something we would, we would do. But for the purposes of October 1's count, it really is how many students are you serving with IEPs and how many students are in the child find? And I know we've got some backup and honestly, uh, Sandy, you can come off mute and tell me to stop talking at any point when I, because I don't want to confuse matters, but for the purposes of the October one count for what we need to do in terms of being able to get your second quarter of funding to you, the most basic information that's needed is how many students are you serving who have IEPs and how many students are in the child find? We know we do need some additional data, but Beth, to your point about trying to chase down some of the specifics, um, that that is that can come after the October one count. And I'm saying that right now, and and I want to make sure that 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 we're all set. But what we, what has been sent out in, in terms of the spreadsheet, in terms of just the basic information, is is the most important thing for the October one count. Yeah, I was think I was just referencing that in in enrollment when we're enrolling kids that there's a data point in there that's required on the environment that they're in, and that goes to the six eighteen data collection, the federal data collection. I that's I was just making sure that we you know that it gets established at some point and and soon about what the amount of time is that the child will be in a program, which is separate from the funding side of it, which on the spreadsheet, right? No. Yes, I'm nodding my head because I believe so, but a little bit removed. So Paula's, I- Paula's shaking her head too. <laughs> nodding her head, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's completely separate. And so I understand the need for that, but I also, 
want to make sure that there isn't confusion at the local level about what we need for the funding for us to be able to fund them. And then, of course, I understand there's another need for this, uh, all of this other information that you're talking about, but that isn't what we need in the next week. So I just don't want to uh, panic everybody. Okay, so it sounds like I'm hearing, don't panic, school districts. Get the spreadsheet to us when you can after October 1st, and then we will work with you and the data team on ensuring that the codes are in there correctly. Is that what I'm hearing? Everybody nodding their heads, thumbs up, okay. So Susie, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing. And then Paula, it looks like you put in there that you want the spreadsheets by October 7th. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few updates. Um, I am sure everybody remembers from last week that we talked about that tomorrow there's going to be a COAST training and we are going to be sharing that link. Susie, that's at three tomorrow? I think so. Uh, I think so. <laughs> yep. So there's been a lot of meetings here, so let me check. Let me make sure. It is at 3.30 to 4.30 is my on my calendar. Great. Thank you. The other thing that we've been doing is meeting with all of the SAUs that are in cohort one to review the MOUs. And during that time, if we remember, we've been asking um, for input on future professional development or technical assistance. So if I haven't asked you that, because I forgot, we would love for you to share with us your thoughts on areas that you would like more professional development or technical assistance. And it could be, you don't know because you don't know at this point, but that's fine. Um, we do have a couple sessions being planned. One is on uh, challenging behaviors and student discipline. We have one coming up on developmental delay as that is a new identification category that most of you will be looking at. And I believe next week or in two weeks, we will also have during our cohort meeting some information on toileting for our preschoolers. So those are just a couple of the, the hot things that have come up since the beginning of school. And we're trying to respond to that by offering technical assistance and professional development. So please send any ideas that you have to myself or Jen, and we will be working on a professional development calendar for the rest of the year. So the last thing that I have to add today is there's been a question about the definition of child find, and I believe that came from the business managers. And so what we are going to do is attach a definition that we've pulled from user about child find. And so I'm assuming that the question came up about how to count the students in our count. I'm looking at Megan to see if you remember where the question is. Yes, that, I'll help that. I'm I'll the one who brought that up. Um, okay one of the business managers looking at the spreadsheet that we were just referring to for the count that we need done next Tuesday and given to us by the 7th, she, she, was, a, she was asking what is child find. So I wanna make sure that everybody who's uh, putting together this spreadsheet understands what we're looking for as far as those counts go for the funding. Okay, so we have what we consider a child find policy, which basically spells out a school's responsibility for identifying children that may have a disability in proceeding with the um, process. I think we might be mixing up our terms a little bit because what we're asking for in that count is for names of children that we have signed parent consent and so that has raised a couple questions. So yes, we um, technically we're supposed to do child find on all new students, right? And or students that we suspect a disability. That includes students that have consecutive unexcused absences, children who are incarcerated, 
um, any that you suspect are in need of special education or related services. Um, so we all know that kind of general definition of child find, but for the purposes of this count, what we want is from your first day of school to the end of September, if you have assigned parent consent during that time. I'm looking at Paula, you're shaking your head yes, so I've got clarified that. We have had questions of what about signed parent consents for children who are already identified. And those we are not considering as part of this count. It's a different um, amount that we're allocating. So we wanna make sure that we capture that correctly. So any questions about child find or how we're doing it on the count that's in the spreadsheet. And yes, um, Kati, we will make sure that you have the spreadsheet. I don't have a copy of it right now to attach. Maybe Jen does. I think I emailed it to her this morning when I sent the email out to the data specialists and the business managers. I think she was on my list. Okay, so Beth, it looks like you have a question about students who are transitioning from part C to part B. And you have signs parental consent. There isn't a parental consent. They're in the midst of additional evaluations. So we'd be picking the student up, but the student, we're in that awkward phase of phasing out of CDS. Mm -hmm. Student is two years, 11 months. We're participating in meetings, participating in coordinating evaluations, but I just want to make sure we don't double count them if CDS still counts them as part C. If you are representing as part B and have been part of that conversation for evaluations and you have signed parental consent and you are, you're the entity that is completing those evaluations, you would count them. Okay, so it's still a little bit iffy because it's a student uh, main center for children um, deaf and hard of hearing are completing the evaluation. So we are representing at the meetings, but we are not completing the evaluations, but certainly there to receive information and support the IEP development of that student. Yes, you would still count them. If, if you were to take away that Main Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing was completing them and you were paying for a staff person or a speech therapist to complete it, that would fall under child find. They're still okay. technically the district of responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. District of, yeah. Okay, but the student doesn't turn three until October 15th. So just the fact that we're representing does allow us to count them under child find. Yes. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Great Yes, question. but. We're we're looking for as of October one these counts, so that will technically come if it's an October fifteenth three year old, that will come on the next quarter count. Well, I'm I'm sorry. I just want to be really clear. If we have the signed, um, if this, we have the signed permission for for assessment by October one, even though the child's not going to turn three, that's when that's when the child find clock starts okay um, and so thank you so, yep so just be be clear about that um and so that's that's really going to be the the piece and again my my disclaimer is always these are decisions that we make for cohort one some of those may shift as as our systems change and as we take on additional cohorts but for you for right now for october one that is the rule final answer thank you Meg. <laughs> Yeah, I know, and, and I understand things are going to change, and that's why we're all doing this together. I just want to make sure that I understand, like, we certainly won't count one that, you know, isn't even near transition, but 
when we're putting in that time, I just wanted to understand that better. And it sounds like still the law after two years, nine months, if we're actively participating, we count them for now and then we'll figure it out later. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Renee. So I, this is along that same line. I just want to make sure I'm clear. I have consent for placement for a two-year-old who will be three in November, and then we will start their services then. Do I wait to count them next time, or do I count them now where I have consent for that placement? Do you have, con is it a consent for evaluation or consent that, for? That was already done through CDS. Um, we met, talked about the evaluations, um, developed an IEP. There's consent for initial placement of or you know, provision of services, and we will pick that child up to start servicing them in November. So then I would assume that you would count on the January 1st count? Yeah. Yeah, the enrollments we're 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 using, we have to have a day, one day. Who who's enrolled at that okay. time? So it's October one and then the next one will be January one. Okay. So even though I have provision of services, I just have to wait until we're actually servicing them. Yeah, okay. sorry. No, nope, that's all right. I just want to be clear. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Yes, thank you for that question. So they didn't have, they didn't evaluate that child. Is that what we're saying? So that they didn't have child find responsibility for that. Sounds okay. like he was already evaluated, found eligible. And but we'll only start. the district can find him eligible, right? It's not CDS that finds him eligible. We were invited to the meeting and the IEP team, including district representatives, um, found him eligible wrote the IEP, written notice, went home, provision was signed. So it was just transferring in from CDS, mm -hmm. not an initial. Yeah, we were in the middle of the process. Okay, makes sense. Got it, thanks. Does anybody have any questions about any of the information that we covered today. It's very exciting that we now have a website that you can reference or go to to find all of the recorded um, cohort one meetings or any of the professional development that we put out. We've talked a little bit more about those LRE codes and the scenarios on how you figure those out. Please join tomorrow for the COAST training. And that is for anybody who might be um, helping make those decisions in an IEP meeting or when that happens. And we reviewed, we reviewed quite a bit the, um, the spreadsheet and then the LRE codes that are different pieces of information, but we both, we need them both at some point. So if there are no other questions, then I think we are all set. Thank you.